AMD just launched their Ryzen 7000 series CPUs, and as I said in my previous video, uh, for these new processors, you will need to get a new motherboard that has an AM5 socket. And today, I'm gonna go over eight different AM5 motherboards from ASUS that just came in, and I'm gonna talk about uh, all the new features they come with, uh, all the differences between them, and most importantly, uh, which ones make the most sense to buy. So let's begin. This video is brought to you by Corsair and their brand new Dominator Platinum RGB memory. These super fast DDR5 6000 memory kits are specifically made for AMD and their Ryzen 7000 series CPUs. They feature a stylish aluminum heat spreader with DHX technology that keeps them nice and cool under load, offering a smooth and stable performance with a lot of room for overclocking. And they also come with 12 customizable Capellix LEDs that you can control with their IQ software and easily sync up with your other Corsair components. So check them out using the link in the description down below. AM5 boards can come with several different chipsets, but for now, only higher-end X670 and X670E boards will be available, but uh, more affordable B650 and 650E boards should be uh, just around the corner. There are several feature upgrades that this new generation of boards comes with, uh, but the two biggest ones, in my opinion, are definitely support for DDR5 and PCIe Gen 5. Now, PCIe Gen 5 is not something that you should really worry about right now because uh, Gen 5 SSDs will not be launched before next year and uh, all current GPUs don't really make any use of it. But in the future, when Gen 5 SSDs and GPUs become a thing, you will be able to run them simultaneously on these X670E motherboards. Since AMD promised to continue using this chipset until at least 2025, uh, getting these features now and having your board ready for a CPU and GPU upgrade in three years is definitely a good thing, and it somewhat eases the pain of seeing some of the prices of these motherboards. DDR5, however, has a bigger impact right now. It offers uh, some performance improvements over DDR4, especially in some specific tasks, uh, but on the other hand, it is also more expensive and certainly one of the reasons your new Ryzen 7000 build will not be cheap. On the positive side, these AM5 boards are compatible with AM4 coolers, so most coolers you can buy today uh, will work completely fine. You just need to keep in mind that the power consumption of these new processors is higher than before, so you will want to buy a proper tower cooler if you go for Ryzen 5 or 7, and you will definitely want to buy a nice all-in-one if you're going for Ryzen 9s. Another really nice feature that AM5 is offering is support for USB 4.0, which means that you will be able to use really fast external storage, but also Thunderbolt 3 devices, which was only possible with Intel CPUs until now. Now, you will only find this feature on higher-end boards, but uh, some other manufacturers, for example, don't offer it at all. So let's see what ASUS put together here. I have eight different models, and I'll start with the most basic of them, uh, which is the Tough Gaming X670E+, and then go all the way up to their flagship model, which is the ROG Crosshair X670E Extreme. The name Tough, ASUS uses for their entry to mid-tier gaming boards, but this new one actually looks like a proper, heavy, well-built, stylish motherboard with big heat sinks all around and a very nice set of features, actually. It offers eight fan headers, three addressable RGB headers, and one RGB one. It has an internal Type-C header and four M.2 slots, of which the top one is PCIe Gen 5. Now, three of the four are covered with a heatsink. The back I.O. has a nice integrated I.O. shield, and it includes 10 USB ports, 2.5 gigabit LAN, and Wi-Fi 6E, with an external Wi-Fi antenna, which is something that ASUS included with every single board in this video. That being said, there is a non-Wi-Fi version of this board that will cost you a bit less. Now, this one is supposed to cost around $330, so I expect the non-Wi-Fi version to come closer to $310-ish. Uh, VRM-wise, this Tough has a 14 plus 2 70 amp power stage uh, setup, and with these large heat sinks, it means that this board and every ATX board position above it shouldn't have problems handling a Ryzen 9 CPU, even though I expect to see this board more often paired with Ryzen 5s or Ryzen 7 processors. Now, the things that are missing here are enthusiast features like physical buttons, uh, postcode, and it almost has no RGB. So 
If you're just looking to build a PC to simply game on and you don't really care about if it has RGB or not, this board should be just enough. The X670E Prime is a very pretty motherboard with its silver and white color scheme, but I also kind of think that the silver part is a bit too dominant. Uh, their previous Prime boards were mostly white and perfectly matched their white ROG GPUs, but this one only has a few white details and it just doesn't go as well in a white build as I would like it to be. And Asus doesn't really offer any light silver graphics cards to match it. Anyway, although it visually looks very different from the tough motherboard, it is pretty much the same board underneath with a near identical feature set. So you get the same amount of M.2 slots, the same VRM design, the same 10 USB ports and 2.5 gigabit LAN on the rear IO. And the only noticeable difference is the addition of the Q release button to make it easy to take your GPU out. Uh, you get a heatsink on your fourth M.2 slot and you get a tiny bit more RGB. Uh, that ups the price by $20 over the tough, which I think seems reasonable, even if you just want it for the color scheme. Now, next up is the ROG Strix eBoard, and this is the one I expect most users to go for. It actually reminds me of the previous Hero boards that are positioned above it and cost a lot more. So now the Strix uh, basically got a lot of peak features that Hero boards used to have while costing quite a bit less. And that is a very good thing since it costs more than enough to begin with, launching at $500, while the Hero is around $700. It is a stunning looking board design-wise with a lot of RGB, a lot of little details and lots of metal heat sinks everywhere, but it does have a couple of very sharp edges and points, and I kind of learned that the hard way. As I said before, this board now comes with some of the enthusiast features that you used to have to buy a Hero for. So you get a postcode, you get physical buttons, and the usual overclocking features. It also has an 18 plus 2, 110 amp power stage setup, so you're more likely to fry your CPU before your motherboard becomes a bottleneck for overclocking. Connections are similar to the other boards. You get eight fan headers, you get three addressable RGB headers and a single RGB one. You get four M.2 SSD slots, out of which three support PCIe Gen 5. On the back, you get a total of 13 USB ports, 2.5 gigabit LAN, and an optical connection. And it also comes with some extra, like this thick double SSD heatsink with a different design that you can uh, use instead of the thinner one. And you get this GPU holder to prevent your graphics card from sagging. So this board has everything except for the USB 4 support and some niche features like a 10 gigabit LAN. But let's check out the Hero. Now I personally always loved Hero boards and yet again they managed to make a well-built, beautifully designed motherboard. But Hero boards have become more expensive with every single generation with this one coming in at $700. Seeing how good the Strix E has become and how it has almost all of the features most people care about really makes it hard to recommend and to justify buying a Hero over the Strix one. Unless you need some of the specific features that make the Hero stand out. And those are uh, things like a few extra overclocking and water cooling related headers, a PCIe Gen 5 slot for the M.2 expansion card that allows you to add more NVMe SSDs to your system, and a second USB 3.0 header for those cases that have four USB 3 ports. If we look at the VRMs, there are 18 plus 2, 110 amp power stages with a large heatsink above them. And on the back, there are 12 USB ports out of which two are USB 4, so there's also an upgrade over the Strix. So the Hero is, as you would expect, that super complete board that a lot of people will want to own, but Again, with Strix being so close feature-wise, you really need to sit down and think about if those couple of features that I just mentioned are worth the extra money for you or not. But if you don't care about how much money you're gonna pay for your motherboard, you can always go the extreme route. The ROG Crosshair X670E Extreme is an absolutely insane extended ATX board. It is their flagship model and it definitely flaunts and radiates its top tierness. It easily weighs a couple of kilos because it has metal plates uh, all over the front and the back. And feature-wise, it has 
everything. It is literally a showcase of how much they can fit on one board and then stuff in its box. So you get just about every possible connection with many of them nicely hidden on the side. And there are actually a ton of extra, including a special add-in expansion card that fits more M.2 SSDs on the side of your memory and the ROG True Voltition for extreme overclockers. You also get an extra fan and an RGB hub, plus a bunch of splitter cables, which brings the total number of fan headers to 19, a total number of addressable and RGB headers to 12, and even though it has the same amount of USB ports on the back, uh, they did add 10 gigabit LAN as well. And they even upgraded the VRM design this time around, bringing the total to 20 plus two 110 amp power stages. Now this one comes in at $1,000 and that is an insane amount of money to spend on a motherboard and no reasonable person should really buy this. But there are always people that do want the most exclusive flagship model and that's why ASUS is making these and keep in mind, they're also selling them. So I would never recommend that you buy this because it will not really make your system run any faster but there is still a specific target audience for these motherboards and they won't care how much it costs. For small form factor fans, ASUS released the ROG Strix X670EI gaming Wi-Fi. They have a very good history of making high-end ITX boards and this is exactly that. A build quality and design are excellent and they're making good use of the height to fit more onto a small motherboard like this one. So the two M.2 slots are stacked up and there's another vertical extension that adds a few more headers. Obviously, this is not going to compete with uh, ATX boards when it comes to connections, but you still get more than I expect most people will need, including a USB Type-C. You only get three fan headers, uh, so you might want to buy a splitter if you need to connect more fans to it. For the VRMs, you get a 10 plus 2, 110 amp power stage setup, and that is enough for the Ryzen 9 7900X that I have here. But ASUS did add a heatsink on the back for some extra cooling, plus they added a tiny fan in the I.O. cover in case anyone wants to overclock their 7950X, I assume. Personally, I am not really a big fan of active cooling on motherboards, but I didn't really have time yet to test it properly and see how much noise it actually makes. Now the rear IO has 10 USB ports, including two USB 4 connections, as well as 2.5 gigabit LAN and Wi-Fi 6E. You don't find audio headers on the back, but instead ASUS added the ROG Hive. And this functions as an external DAC for your audio, but it also gives you access to the overclock and flex keys directly from your desk. So that is kind of cool. At $470, this board is pretty expensive as well, but we still have to see any ITX boards from the competition because neither MSI, Gigabyte, nor ASRock have shown us any. And then we have the Gene, a proper high-end micro ATX board, and those are actually extremely rare. Uh, most Intel generations uh, didn't get one, and this is the very first time they made one for AMD CPUs, and I get that there are not many high-end MATX cases and the focus is either on big towers or small SFF systems and the demand is just not there, I guess. But if you do want to get a high-end micro ATX uh, motherboard, this is the most complete one you can buy. Feature-wise, it falls in between the ITX board and the ATX options, but you still get plenty, including six fan headers, three M.2 slots and 10 USB ports, including two USB 4 ones. For the VRMs, you get a 16 phase, 110 amp power stage setup. So even a 7950X will be fine here. And you get the same true voltition from the extreme for overclocking. Again, $600 for this is a lot, but I also doubt anyone else is going to offer an alternative to this. And the last board I have for today is the ProArt X670E Creator. And the name ProArt suggests that the target audience is a bit different than for the other boards. It is made for creators and it offers some of the features that you won't really find on most other boards. So this one includes a 10 gigabit LAN header and it has a display port in connection to feed uh, the display signal from a dedicated GPU through the USB 4 ports on the back. It is not something I expect most people to use, but there are use cases where it can be really helpful. 
uh, like for example uh, connecting your Apple Studio display to your PC. It is a good looking board too, but it doesn't make a lot of sense if you don't need those specific features because other than that, it is pretty similar to the top board, so you won't find any hobbyist features here like physical buttons or a postcode. And at $500, the Strix is the more logical board to buy, but again, this does something that very few, if any, other boards will offer at this price. I think one of the biggest strengths that these ASUS boards have to offer is their BIOS. Now, I might be a little bit biased because I've been using ASUS boards for uh, the majority of my rigs over the years, and we actually use them here for most of the testing, but that is also kind of the reason I use them so much. They have simply given me the least amount of headaches over the years. Uh, even with this generation, it is so much nicer to just grab the Hero, for example, from the box and have it work instantly uh, with the memory profiles of the memory you're testing with, compared to the, let's say, Astrock Tai Chi that the CPUs came with, uh, because I actually had to go through three different biases, of which uh, one didn't apply settings correctly for some reason, and another one was just constantly crashing the whole system. And every generation, uh, ASUS brings some new cool BIOS options. So for example, uh, this year they added dynamic OC switch that I think is pretty useful. So most users uh, typically benefit from AMD's PBO or Precision Boost Overdrive, which uh, boosts some cores a bit higher when possible. But if you do a traditional manual overclock, you usually lose this feature. So, uh, the Dynamic OC will actually switch between a PBO and your manual OC to give you the best of both worlds, depending on what is needed, right? Similarly, uh, the new Core Flex feature lets you adjust your uh, CPU behavior depending on different variables, uh, like temperatures, for example, or a type of a load. So if you're willing to put in some time, uh, you can really fine tune your CPU performance even further with this feature. Anyway, which of these boards makes the most sense? So some of the niche options like the ITX here, like the Gene and Pro Art, will kind of speak for themselves uh, because they just fit specific cases. Uh, with the others though, I think that the Tough and the Prime, uh, depending on your color preference, should probably be the first ones to look at. Because when we look at this table, they have a surprisingly good general feature set. So for most gaming or workstation rigs, they have enough and probably more than most people will need. So unless you need a specific feature, it's probably not worth buying a more expensive board. And if you want to save up even more, in a few weeks, cheaper B650 boards will be an option for you, but they will offer a more basic feature set. And for those higher-end builds, a Strix board might make more sense because you do get more RGB, you get a postcode, you get some buttons and some extra overclocking features. So if you're looking to overclock further or make an already expensive custom loop, this one can make sense. It is still expensive, but at least you get almost everything that you can think of. And if you want USB 4 on top of that and you have some more money to spend, the Hero will still be the real top tier full feature option in the ROG lineup. Anyway, that is where I will leave it today. I hope this video was helpful. If you have any questions about these boards or you have something that you would like me to look into, please leave a comment down below. Bye guys and see you in the next one.